Hello, on November 30th, the American University of Armenia organized a conference on mining and socio-economic development, Armenia's choices. The conference had three panel discussions. The first panel discussion discussed whether mining can play a key role in economic growth and socio-economic development. The second panel discussed the impact of mining on environmental and public health. And the third panel discussed legal and institutional uh, issues, regulations that play with the mining sector and how they foster economic development. Um, I am here honored to host the keynote speaker and the second panel's speaker of the conference, Dr. Ali, um, Salim Ali and Dr. Vartu Petrosyan. Um, Dr. Salim Ali is the director of the Center for Social Responsibility and Mining at the University of Queensland, Australia. And Vartu Petrosyan is the associate dean of the College of Health Sciences of the American University of Armenia. Thank you. We are very honored to have you at CivilNet. Um, uh, Dr. Professor Ali, you have also been um, a founder of a number of institutions. You have been called by the um, World Economic Forum, a young, a young global leader. You have been called the alchemist. And finally, you have been named um, an environmental peacemaker. What kind of war are we speaking about? What kind of peace are you making? Well, thank you very much for this invitation, first of all. Um, I think when we think about natural resources, there's a tendency to think about them as uh, divisible issues, so that if one person is gaining, the other is going to lose. And what I've tried to do in my work is to suggest that um, while there are some kinds of natural resources which are very much distributive, like water, for example, um, you can find ways by focusing on the quality of the resource to use them as a means of actually fostering cooperation. So um, with mining and mineral development, uh, of course, it's an emotional issue. In many cases, it, it, it deals with values that people hold very dear. So it can lead to conflict. But if you think about uh, mineral development in the larger context of uh, poverty alleviation, uh, and doing it in a way which is actually constructive, you can use it as a means of getting communities across a nation together uh, and um, re rethinking the distribution of wealth if done properly as well. Dr. Petrosyan, in terms of the impact of mining on uh, environmental and public health, uh, do we have that conflict, uh, especially based on your findings that you presented today at the conference? Do we have conflicts? Do we have a war? Do we need a peacemaker there? Um, I can say that we have certain issues in certain areas of Armenia that are involved in mining or min mining-related activities. And as I showed for Alaverdi city, we have the levels of lead and arsenic over the maximum permittable levels, which means we have to do something. If it's not war, then it's collaboration, but we for sure have to think about our kids because as I mentioned, the playgrounds of kindergarten and schools are also affected. And when the ch children are playing there, they're exposed and they can, be, can have lead and arsenic in their system and later in their life get sick. So we have to do something. So it's more of an intergenerational maybe conflict in a way, the adults thinking about the children or their problems. Is that what you're suggesting? I am not considering it as a conflict, but I think as adults, we have to take responsibility for our children. And as citizens, we have to take responsibility for our peer citizens who are living in those communities. Are, are your findings dramatic in terms of, uh, of their significance? I cannot say that our findings are dramatic because uh, these are just initial site assessments. We have to do thorough environmental and health risk assessment to be able to say that, you know, this is really dramatic. All we have done is initial risk assessment which mentions or identifies communities where we need to work more Yes. identify all the issues and develop a plan, action plan.
for taking Is this steps. action plan in your pipeline? Is this going to happen eventually? This uh, uh, actually, the next step after uh, this risk assessment, we are going to share our findings with the Ministries of Health and Ministry of Nature Protection. Uh, later, uh, we are going to hopefully have conferences, seminars, where the country should prioritize which sites should be in our focus and which sites need immediate actions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ali, you are the director of the Center for um, Social Responsibility in Mining. Uh, what is social responsibility in mining? Is this something that came along corporate responsibility, corporate social responsibility in general? Um, and what is it in terms of the relative time di dimension? For example, for Armenia, uh, corporate social responsibility is a, a quite new phenomenon, um, not, not well investigated, not even well practiced uh, due to its situation with the transitional economy. But what is the situation uh, in the more developed countries uh, and what is um, social responsibility in mining? Yes, so um, social responsibility in mining is very much in sync with the broader theme of corporate social responsibility. The mining sector has been somewhat late coming to the CSR um, discourse and uh, so they've also had to require much more regulatory pressure to move forward. Um, our center uh, in Australia was established 10 years ago as a public-private partnership between industry as well as uh, the government, uh, the provincial government or the state government in Queensland, Australia. And so it was very much in the context of this collaborative spirit of getting companies to work with government who are regulating them uh, and to establish an independent organization within a university that could monitor, help do research, train professionals for the, uh, the sector. So. Um, social responsibility deals with the whole broad range of issues including environmental factors which are a very critical aspect of it, um, legal and community relations agreements, grievance mechanisms, uh, issues around resettlement of communities. Um, we also focus a lot on indigenous communities which is not as much an issue here in Armenia but in many parts of the world there are a, a lot of uh, tensions around indigenous rights and uh, native title for example in Australia who has title to the land and ownership issues. So all of that comes within the, the, this broader domain of uh, social responsibility. And do you think that it is possible uh, just by the individual actions of a private company or there must be a public-private partnership or the state institutions that have to have a leading role or teach as you have been saying that they have been teaching? Yes, no, I think regulation is essential really because the, the, the whole model for uh, corporate performance is around uh, maximizing profit. So uh, unless you have regulatory pressure, uh, you're not going to have a very fruitful outcome. So voluntary compliance can be helpful for some companies which already have a good base and capacity but for a lot of the smaller companies the new players getting into the field as is the case in Armenia where you have a lot of smaller companies who are involved uh, you will definitely need some regulatory pressure so um, I think uh, that, that's where Armenia re really needs to develop its capacity and improve its regulatory system uh, I know you've started that process, but clearly there's still a lot more which needs to be done as was evident in the conference discussion. Is that your conclusion after the conference because you were following the entire conference and uh, the Armenian situation was presented thoroughly? Yes. Uh, is, that, is that what you think is an imperative? I think yeah. so, yes. I was uh, in the last panel especially quite alarmed to find that uh, there isn't really uh, much in terms of environmental civil action um, available through the law. So it's very difficult for um, citizen groups to bring lawsuits uh, against corporate players if there is environmental harm. And having that provision in the legal system is very important as a safeguard to make sure that there is vigilance. Um, what I was very pleased to see is that the government seems receptive to that. And so we had um, senior government officials who attended the conference and stayed throughout, who listened, uh, who are willing to engage and uh, I'm sure Dr. Petrosian can comment more on that as she'll be you know, involved more at a local level as well with that. 
When we are speaking about environmental or human damage, um, especially the private companies, they always promise mitigating those impacts. Um, how can we differentiate between this real responsibility and what is called uh, greenwashing, uh, looking like they're green, you know, making this impression, especially in the public health um, sense, how can we really differentiate whether there is genuine interest and involvement in protecting people's health and the greenwashing? I want to continue Dr. Ali's point about regulation because even com perfectly competitive markets have to be regulated. The same is here. If we want the companies to be responsible for the impact that they are creating in those communities in terms of environmental and health impact, we need to have proper regulations and not rely on the goodwill of the companies because we ha we may have companies that are interested in helping the communities and we may have companies that are not that's why we have to have uh, good regulations and we have to have the civil society very actively involved in monitoring in continuous monitoring of what mm -hmm. they are thank doing. you do you uh, agree mr ali that uh, greenwashing can be tackled through regulations I think it's a combination of regulation and a vibrant civil society. You, you need the civil society uh, vigilance, but constructive engagement and vigilance, not just there to you know, protest without cause, but to protest when there is cause. Uh, and so a combination of good civil society vigilance and regulation, that's how you can have transparency, you can prevent corruption. It's a time-tested model, you know, having um, this relationship between the, the private citizen and the government working in sync with each other. So you have mentioned the important role of the civil society as advocates. Um, as a representative of academia, what do you think uh, the academic institution uh, can do as an advocate in terms of advocacy? For example, does your um, institution engage in advocacy? I think our primary goal should be creating evidence. We need to engage in research that will measure environmental and health impact of mining and related activities in Armenia. And we should stay impartial, independent, so that people trust our opinion. We shouldn't take a part. We should generate evidence and data. And um, today you mentioned that economic growth is um, is necessary but not sufficient for uh, social development. Um, what other conditions are necessary? What especially would you consider in the Armenian context as you have followed the conference? What is Armenia's next step to make um, to make the different sectors of the economy, but particularly mining, a contributor to the social uh, development? Well, I think um, for any kind of economy to be resilient, to be able to withstand different kinds of natural disasters or economic crisis, it needs to diversify. So Armenia is in a situation where it is very vulnerable because it has, for example, two of its neighbors with whom it does not have very good relations. Uh, it um, has, uh, it's geographically landlocked. Uh, it has uh, very limited opportunities in terms of uh, agriculture because there's only about 17% of the land is arable. Um, so given those constraints, it has to try and use that mineral wealth to diversify. So that's going to be very important to continue with the development of the financial sector, which is the fastest growing sector currently in Armenia as a service sector, um, continuing to explore ways in which tourism can be developed. And tourism and mining can coexist. It doesn't have to be one or the other. There are many examples of cases where you could have a mining economy and a tourist economy, but it needs to be managed well with clear relevance to environmental health criteria and so on. So I think that's going to be key. How well is the country able to diversify? Uh, how well is it able to use its very strong educational base with, uh, among the highest literacy rates in the region? How can it use that to actually harness that, um, the, 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 that potential within its uh, citizens?
And uh, Dr. Petrosyan, what are the country's next steps in terms of protecting people's health and or improving people's health? I mentioned regulation. At the same time, we need more research. We just made a small study, which was initial risk assessment. We need more thorough studies and involving different uh, mining areas. The one that we did uh, focused on metal minings, but I think we have issues also with you know, stone and sand mining. Uh, our part, one of our participants mentioned about silicosis as an issue. So regulation plus more research providing with uh, data for our decision makers and policy makers and also bringing the evidence from other countries who have already successfully developed good regulations. We can learn from other countries who learn from their mistakes. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that our uh, research will be, the research capacity will be enough to conduct that research and I hope that our policy makers will actually have the ear to listen to that, uh, uh, the, the findings of those um, research projects. Uh, thank you, we have been very honoured to have you and we wish you best of luck and especially on your return to Australia, such a far country. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for you. the opportunity.